would you teach me someday about peyote? He did not answer and, as he had done before, simply looked at me as if I were crazy. I had mentioned the topic to him various times already, and every time he frowned and shook his head. It was not an affirmative or negative gesture, it was rather a gesture of despair and disbelief. He stood up abruptly. We had been sitting on the ground in front of his house. An almost imperceptible shake of his head was the invitation to follow him. We went into the desert chaparral in a southerly direction. He mentioned repeatedly as we walked that I had to be aware of the uselessness of my self-importance and of my personal history. Your friends, he said, turning to me abruptly. Those who have known you for a long time, you must leave them quickly. I thought he was crazy, and his insistence was idiotic, but I did not say anything. He peered at me and began to laugh. After a long hike, we came to a halt. I was about to sit down to rest, but he told me to go some 20 yards away and talk to a batch of plants in a loud and clear voice. I felt ill at ease and apprehensive. His weird demands were more than I could bear, and I told him once more I could not speak to plants because I felt ridiculous. His only comment was that my feeling of self-importance was immense. He seemed to have made a sudden decision and said I should not try to talk to the plants until I felt easy and natural about it. You want to learn about them, and yet you don't want to do any work, he said accusingly. What are you trying to do? My explanation was that I wanted bona fide information about the uses of plants. Thus, I had asked him to be my informant. I had even offered to pay him for his time and trouble. You should take the money, I said. This way, we both would feel better. I could then ask you anything I want because you would be working for me, and I would pay you for it. What do you think of that? He looked at me contemptuously and made an obscene sound with his mouth, making his lower lip and his tongue vibrate by exhaling with great force. That's what I think of it, he said and laughed hysterically at the look of utmost surprise that I must have had on my face. It was obvious to me that he was not a man I could easily contend with. In spite of his age, he was full of energy and unbelievably strong. I had had the idea, being so old, he could have been the perfect informant for me. Old people, I had been led to believe, made the best informants because they were too feeble to do anything else except talk. Don Juan, on the other hand, was a miserable subject. I felt he was unmanageable and dangerous. The friend who had introduced us was right. He was an eccentric old Indian, and although he was not plastered out of his mind most of the time, as my friend had told me, he was worse yet. He was crazy. I again felt the terrible doubt and apprehension I had experienced before. I thought I had overcome that. In fact, I had no trouble at all convincing myself that I wanted to visit him again. The idea had crept into my mind, however, that perhaps I was a bit crazy myself when I realized that I liked to be with him. His idea that my feeling of self-importance was an obstacle had really made an impact on me. But all that was apparently only an intellectual exercise on my part. The moment I was confronted with his odd behavior, I began to experience apprehension and I wanted to leave. I said that I believed we were so different there was no possibility of our getting along. One of us has to change, he said, staring at the ground. And you know who.